and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. In this episode we'll be exploring the murder of 26-year-old nurse Debbie Romazaro in Oldham, Greater Manchester in 2002. Debbie travelled to the country just two years earlier and sadly her life in the UK ended in such a tragic way. Since her murder there have been investigations both nationally and across the world. However, her case still remains unsolved. I've used a number of quite detailed articles from the Manchester Evening News, amongst other sources, for my research into this case. The links, as always, are in the show notes. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Debbie Ramazaro was born and brought up by her parents, Father Dionisio and Mother Alicia, in the small village of Kinalansan, in the municipality of San Jose Camarines, in the Philippines. Kinalansan has a population of just a few thousand people, and its economy is mostly made up of agriculture and fishing. Debbie's father worked as a rice farmer, while her mother was a teacher, and she grew up with three siblings. As she grew up, Debbie was known by those that knew her as a gentle and humble young woman. She was a devout Catholic and took her faith very seriously. As Debbie was such a caring and thoughtful person, it made sense to her family and friends when she decided to train to be a nurse. It was a perfect fit for Debbie and was also a good career move. As she was from such a small village, going into nursing would mean that she would be able to gain some new experiences away from Kina Lansan, but would also mean that she could earn a better wage than she could at home. By all accounts, Debbie was dedicated to her training and enjoyed being a nurse. Her caring personality shone through when she was looking after patients. As the year 2000 approached, Debbie was in her early 20s and enjoying the career path that she had taken. It was around this time that an opportunity came up that she decided to take. The UK Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, had pledged to increase the number of nurses in the country by 20,000. The NHS was suffering from understaffing and they needed a large number of trained nurses to take on different positions around the country. It would take new trainees three years to become fully qualified, so they needed another solution. Staffing is often a challenge in areas such as the NHS that rely very heavily on trained members of staff to work long hours, and so the government decided to reach out to other countries in the hope that their nurses may want to relocate to the UK. Thankfully, many countries responded to the call for staff, including the Philippines. Many trained nurses from the country took the opportunity to gain some new experiences and moved to a different country. One of these people was Debbie, who saw this as a next step in her career and an opportunity to earn more money. Many other people also believed this was a good move, and it was reported that many private nursing schools were set up in the Philippines, while the higher education institutions began creating their own nursing schools. Recruitment agencies were set up specifically to meet the demand for nurses. In the year 2000, Debbie made the huge decision to uproot her life and travelled to the UK. She had got herself a job in the town of Oldham, Greater Manchester, as a coronary care nurse at Royal Oldham Hospital. It's reported in the Manchester Evening News that Debbie was one of 30 other Filipino nurses who travelled there. Oldham is around seven miles away from the city of Manchester and had predominantly been an industrial town known for the textile trade and now has a population of around 230,000 people. She settled down in a flat in a building called Summervale House, located on Vale Drive in the town. Importantly for Debbie, the flat was only one and a half miles away from the hospital and was within an easy distance to get to every day. She quickly fell into a routine of going to work, returning home and attending church. Debbie was described as dedicated to her work, and often did not leave herself much time for socialising or other pastimes. She was passionate about helping her family back in the Philippines, and would send a large proportion of her wage back home each month to help them. It was known, however, that Debbie did spend time with other members of the Filipino community that had emerged in Oldham, 
and according to those that knew her, both in the community and at the hospital, Debbie was well-liked and conscientious. Over the next two years, she continued to prove herself as a hard worker, often taking on overtime and gained respect from her co-workers. It was December the 7th, 2002, and it was a cold day in Oldham. Debbie had an early shift that day, starting at 7am. She was on time as usual, and went about her shift as she normally did, finishing at 3pm that afternoon. It was known that she often stayed on later than her shift as she wrote up notes about the patients that she'd seen that day. It's reported in the Manchester Evening News that just before she left, her colleagues noticed that she took a phone call. Her co-workers noticed this phone call as it appeared to leave her looking, as they described, distressed. Debbie then left for the day, and CCTV recovered later, would show that she left the hospital at 3.27pm. It's then known that Debbie returned home at around 3.55pm and let herself into her flat. This was her normal routine and nothing appeared to be out of the ordinary about her movements that day. Debbie was due on a shift the following morning on the 8th of December, however she didn't turn up. This was unusual as she was a punctual member of staff and her co-workers knew that she would never just not turn up without at least letting someone know. Her absence immediately caused concern as it was so out of character. Her colleagues attempted to get in touch with Debbie by phoning her and the phone in her flat. The concern for her only increased when there was no answer. One of her co-workers and friends, fellow nurse Estreita Villacamia, explained that she had a spare key to Debbie's flat. It's reported in a Guardian article from 2004 that she decided to go over there to see if she could find her. At 5.40pm she went to Debbie's flat along with a few of her friends and let herself in with the key. She later explained the awful sight that she saw when she opened the door, stating, We found her lying on the floor. There was lots of blood on her clothes. I felt for a pulse but there was none. I ran out and called an ambulance. The scene in Debbie's flat was gruesome and shocking. It was clear that Debbie had been stabbed. Police would later confirm she had been stabbed multiple times in the neck and chest with what looked like two different knives from her kitchen. The knife wounds had been so vicious that some of them had pierced her heart and lung. The positioning of Debbie's body was something that caught police's eye when they attended the scene. She was lay on the floor of her lounge and appeared to have been placed in a crucifix position. Her face had been covered over with a tablecloth before the killer had left the flat. There was no debate. Debbie was the victim of a violent murder in her own home. Her friends and co-workers were shocked that this could have happened to Debbie. In the days after her murder, police would hear that Debbie didn't exhibit high-risk behaviours and as a rule kept herself to herself. So what had happened to her? Greater Manchester Police began to investigate both Debbie's life and her movements before the murder. The crime scene was also analysed thoroughly. One of the things that police immediately noticed was that the flat had not been broken into. There did not appear to be any forced entry that suggested that the perpetrator had been trying to rob Debbie. There was also nothing substantial missing from the flat. When Debbie's body was analysed, it was also clear that there didn't appear to be a sexual motive. The police considered the fact that Debbie may have let the killer in willingly, and therefore may have been acquainted with them. This was also corroborated by her friends, who stated that Debbie was very security conscious, and would not let anyone into her flat that she didn't know. This was a concern for the community, as it suggested that someone that they may actually know could have committed the murder. While there was no evidence of a sexual motive, detectives knew that this had been what they later described as a brief but frenzied attack. It appeared there was a lot of emotion involved, which again seemed to line up with the fact that this may have been someone with a personal connection to Debbie. Why would someone want to attack her? It appeared she lived a very simple and humble life and didn't seem to have made any enemies since moving to the UK. It's reported in the Manchester Evening News that Detective Superintendent Steve Haywood 
who led the investigation, commented on Debbie's victimology, stating, What is startling is the simplicity of her life. She would get up, go to work, work 12 to 14 hours, come home, make a meal and go to sleep. She didn't socialise much, but did go to church. Her sole purpose was to generate cash for her family back in the Philippines. It seemed as though there was no real motive for the murder, and this was worrying. As the investigation continued, the police were able to narrow down the time period that they believed Debbie had been murdered. The police confirmed from the autopsy that Debbie had died between the hours of 4pm and 7pm on that 7th of December, not long after she returned home from work. Detectives went door-to-door -door at Somervale House in an effort to try and locate witnesses or perhaps anyone that had heard anything strange that night, but unfortunately this did not lead anywhere. Research into the building itself found that it was very secure. It's reported in the Manchester Evening News that the 15-storey block had quite stringent security, including a six-foot-high steel fence and a security guard who operated electronic gates at the front of the property. As well as this, each corridor had electronically operated doors, meaning that to get in, people would have to live there or be visiting with permission. This was particularly telling, as it suggested that whoever had accessed Debbie's flat that day had a reason to be there, perhaps invited by Debbie or because they lived there themselves. There was, of course, the possibility that the perpetrator had managed to evade all of the security measures. Forensic searches of the building also uncovered some evidence in some of the stairways located in the block. A trail of blood was found down the stairs, which when analysed turned out to be Debbie's. This indicated that whoever had committed the crime had fled the flat and travelled down the stairs away from the scene. This seemed to further indicate that this was someone who knew Debbie, or at least possibly had some knowledge of the building. Interviewing Debbie's colleagues at the hospital did bring up some new information. This was the news that Debbie had taken a phone call just after her shift ended that appeared to distress her. While not pointing to a suspect in particular, it did perhaps show that something had happened to upset her in the hours before her death. Those that knew Debbie at the hospital were unaware of any reason why someone would have wanted to hurt her, and were just as baffled as everyone else about the possible motive. The investigation became centred around Debbie's life and the community in which she lived, primarily the Filipino community. There was a suspicion quite early on in the investigation that someone had information and was just not coming forward with it. Detectives looked into Debbie's life and the people in it, including any boyfriends that she had. They learnt that Debbie had some male interests in her life, but she often didn't pursue them. It's reported in the Manchester Evening News that she wasn't interested in boyfriends and often kept them at arm's length. It was believed that she had had a relationship previously with a Filipino man that worked at a hospital in Birmingham. Once again the impression was that Debbie worked to earn the money to send home and that was her main priority. Andy Tattersall was the first officer on the scene and later worked as a cold case investigator for Greater Manchester Police. In a statement to the MEN in 2011, he explained the police theory behind the investigation. He said, We think that Debbie knew her attacker. Debbie was a careful person who would not let anyone other than someone she knew into her flat, someone who could have been in the block. We believe someone went deliberately to the flat to argue with her. There was a significant outburst of anger. It was a frenzied attack in her lounge. Why would anyone get to such a pitch of anger? After the attack, the person responsible clearly placed Debbie in a position. A cloth was placed over her. It could have been a mark of respect. It's telling us that after that murder, they had a feeling of remorse. Debbie's family, who had been notified of her death, were absolutely devastated, and living so far away was no doubt agonising. After the inquest into Debbie's death took place, her body was released to the family and made the over 6,000 mile journey back to her hometown in the Philippines. Debbie's mother would later state, Debbie was only doing this for a better life for us. Now I have lost her, I really miss her. 
Over the next few months, the police continued with their investigation and kept up the pressure in the local community in the hope that someone would come forward with new information. Detectives produced posters in the Filipino language Tagalog, with Debbie's face on displaying information about the murder and a reward. Police distributed these posters in many different places, including at various festivals. Officers from GMP travelled to the Filipino Festival in Rill, North Wales, and they also went to the Filipina Barrio Festa in Hounslow, West London, to hand out the posters to those attending. In April 2003, around five months after Debbie's death, the police stated that they had arrested two people in connection with the murder. This was welcome news for those that knew Debbie, and it was hoped that it may eventually solve what happened to her. It was reported that a 26-year-old man and a 31-year-old woman had been arrested. The two suspects were interviewed by detectives and were granted bail until the following month. It was decided, however, that the two people would be released without any charge. This was, of course, a disappointment for Debbie's loved ones, who had hoped that this may mean Debbie could get some justice. Police made more appeals throughout 2003, however were unable to gain any new leads or lines of inquiry. December marked the one-year anniversary of Debbie's murder, and there was still no concrete conclusion to the case. Her friends and the community decided to arrange a service to remember Debbie at St Patrick's Church in Oldham, to mark the anniversary. Many people from the Filipino community in Oldham, and people that knew Debbie, attended the service and remembered her for the kind, caring and generous person that she was. Greater Manchester Police decided to once again make an appeal to the public to mark the anniversary. Along with this appeal, there was also some new evidence presented. Detective Superintendent Steve Haywood told the BBC at the time, After months of forensic examinations from swabs taken at the flat, we were provided with a DNA profile which we believe belongs to the killer. As well as proving that someone was in the flat at the time of Debbie's death, I would like to reiterate that it can also eliminate anyone whose name we are given. If people out there suspect someone they know may have been involved, I would urge them to contact us. He added, We will not give up trying to find who murdered Debbie. Due to the fact that we have DNA, it is only a matter of time before we catch the person responsible. GMP also announced that there was a £10,000 reward being offered for information that led to the conviction of the killer. This information was very positive, as it now meant that they had narrowed down the suspects by gaining a DNA profile. This of course also meant that they needed suspects to check the profile against. It was hoped that the reward may bring more people forward. It's reported that following on from the DNA discovery, officers also returned to Royal Oldham Hospital to once again interview witnesses and acquaintances of Debbie's. However, the reason for this was not revealed to the public. Months and years passed by in the case without any progress. Unfortunately, Debbie's case had become cold. Despite the case being reviewed and looked at over the years, and the DNA discovery, 2016 came around with nothing new being announced to the public. After 14 years, Debbie's family became frustrated by the lack of progress on the case, and told the MEN in 2016 that Greater Manchester Police had not been in contact with them for over a decade. Debbie's brother Dennis stated, 14 years has passed and we never heard again from the Manchester Police and investigators. We are still hoping that with the help of scientific approach and new technologies now, justice for my sister will be served soon. We've been hopeless and frustrated since then, not knowing where and how we can get results of the investigation and the reason why someone killed my sister. Our family would like to appeal for help once again from the Manchester Police Department but they continue to exert more effort in solving the case of Debbie. Maybe the police and investigators will find new breakthroughs with their investigation. Please let the Manchester police know that we're pleading for their help in this case. Hopefully answers will come to us one day. It's clear that Debbie's family had never had closure for what happened to her and are frustrated that so much time has gone by without answers. It's reported that after the MEN told the police about the Ramosero's feelings about the investigation, they did contact them again in relation to the case. 
a GMP force review officer, told the newspaper, No murder investigation is ever closed, and this is certainly the case with the investigation into the murder of Debbie Romosaro. We have reviewed forensic opportunities on a number of occasions, but as yet to no avail. And while we have not been in contact with Debbie's family for some time, we are now in contact with them. As of 2020, there has been no further information distributed to the public, and nobody else has been arrested for Debbie's murder. So what happened to Debbie? It was clear that she was not a high-risk victim. She kept herself to herself and spent most of her time at work or at church. She did not socialise often and did not meet many new people, aside from those she knew from the hospital and from the Filipino community. She was a security-conscious person who would not let just anyone into her flat, and Somervale House was quite a secure building. How, then, had someone gained access to Debbie's flat to commit this murder? I agree with the theory that the killer could have been someone known to Debbie, particularly as there was no forced entry to the flat. Whether this person was someone she knew from church or the hospital, or it was someone that lived in the block, is of course unknown. Whoever the perpetrator was, they had committed a violent attack, which appeared to be filled with emotion, and also showed they possibly felt some remorse afterwards, by covering Debbie's face. Debbie was known to be a kind and caring person, so it's possible that she would have wanted to help someone who came to her door. The police have appealed to the community and the public numerous times in the hope that someone would come forward, and I believe that Debbie's murder may eventually be solved. There is the DNA profile of the killer, and in time someone may be brave enough to speak up and tell the police what they know. I think this is how Debbie's case may get some closure. The Romosaro family are still waiting for justice for their daughter and sister, and I really hope that the investigation continues to progress and that new information emerges soon. The reward in Debbie's case is now £50,000, and the police are appealing for anyone with information to ring the cold case unit for Greater Manchester Police at 0161 851 5961 or Crime Stoppers at 0800 555 111. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I want to thank everyone for their support and kind words about the podcast. I really appreciate it. If you want to help support it even further, you can do a number of different things. You can leave us a review wherever you listen. They really do help and make my day. Thank you, it's me, Laura, from Germany, for your recent five-star review. You can also support us on Patreon, where you can receive shout-out stickers, bonus episodes and ad-free early access episodes five days before the episode arrives on your podcast feed. I want to thank Emily and Wayne for becoming patrons this week, so thank you so much for your support. I have recently changed my benefits on each tier. For $3, you can now receive bonus episodes, as well as shout-outs and stickers. If this interests you, the link for that is in the show notes. You can also help by following me on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter to see posts about the podcasts and pictures from the episodes. If you would like to send in a suggestion for any cases you want me to cover, please contact me on social media or email me at theunseenpodcast at gmail.com. I hope everyone is doing well at the moment and as always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Unseen.